All right, it's time to learn about work and energy after learning a lot about forces. Another way of analyzing motion is analyzing it in terms of energy and work, a very important concept. And in some problems, you can actually get to the answer quicker and more efficiently if we look at it in terms of energy and work. Okay, so work is essentially what we do every day when you get up out of bed or when you apply a force to move yourself over a distance like this little penguin's doing. It's lifting an object and carrying it a distance. So the objectives of this video right now is for us to understand the relationship between work and energy, concepts that we've probably been introduced to before, and then learn how to calculate work perform performed against friction and learn how to calculate work performed against lifting objects. After doing that, you should have an idea of what is meant by this. Work is mad. It's mad to do work. All right, so first, since work is energy, what is energy? Well, energy is the potential for a system to perform work, okay? They go hand in hand. If I have a certain amount of energy, that energy will limit how far I can push something. All right, so a quanti quantized amount of energy is gonna be required to move something a distance, depending on the force that is required to move something, all right? Work and energy are measured in the unit joules. All right, if you look on the back of a chocolate bar, you'll see the unit joules, that is energy. And energy is a system, energy in a system is conserved. It can't be created or destroyed, okay? It doesn't come out of thin air. It, it has a fixed amount. And that energy can only be transformed from one form to another. So what are the different forms of energy that you've learned about? Well, the types of energy that are out there are chemical potential energy, energy stored in bonds that can then be released by a chemical reaction. Kinetic energy is the energy involved in movement. Gravitational potential energy is the energy involved in lifting something against gravity, doing work against gravity. Elastic potential energy is the energy stored in a spring when you have to apply a force to stretch it. Thermal energy is the energy involved in heat and the movement of atoms. And electrical potential energy, we learned about last year, is the energy stored in charge when we have to move charges against forces. Okay, so those are just energy concepts that you've already been uh, introduced to. And of course, there's other types of energy like nuclear energy. We'll learn a little bit later on. But if I know energy, if I know the amount of energy I have, I can then apply it to calculate how far an object will move or how fast an object will accelerate. That's a very important uh, calculation that we'll be able to do. Okay, but going back to this, energy it can, is... Can, it can't be created or destroyed. It can only be transformed from one form to another. So something that's really important for you to understand is that if I have the energy of a system plus the energy of the surroundings of that system, they should always be constant. Okay, that should be constant. All right, so I can't create energy. I can't remove energy. Okay, if I lose energy from a system, it's going to go to my surroundings. If the energy is gained in my system, it's going to come from the surroundings. If they're going to be transferred from one form to another. All right, so let's go to what is work. Well, work is what happens when energy is exerted to move an object a certain distance using a force. Okay, and we often have the formula work is equal to force times distance to calculate energy. Here's an example of somebody climbing stairs, and if you've done that in the morning, you notice that it takes energy out of you to climb the stairs, especially if you're gonna be running after climbing the stairs. So in this situation here, this person is applying, is using the chemical energy stored inside of them to transform it into kinetic energy. She's running at the top of the stairs, and she's gained potential energy because she had to do work against gravity to lift herself up, okay? And we'd be able to calculate the exact amount of kinetic energy and potential energy she has if I was able to find out how many calories or joules she, she burned in that process. Okay, the potential energy I'd be able to calculate by knowing how high she's climbed and the remaining of that would tell me how fast she's running if I was able to know exactly how much energy she used when she climbed up the stairs. All right, so here's a few simple examples that we're gonna start looking at on how to calculate work and energy when we move objects, a very important concept that you'll be using in lab reports, okay? So the first 
concept here we're going to look at is how to calculate the amount of work required to slide objects against friction. In this case, we're sliding a 10 kilogram box 10 meters across a floor with a friction coefficient of 0 0.3 at a constant velocity. Well, that's a lot of stuff. Okay, well, it's important. If I'm sliding at a constant velocity, that means that my acceleration is 0 meters per second. If my acceleration is 0 meters per second, my unbalanced force, F net, is equal to zero newtons. Okay, feel free to pause at any time and start drawing this out for yourself because it's important, okay? So if my unbalanced force is zero newtons, that would mean that the force that this guy is applying is gonna be equal and opposite to the force of friction. So the applied force minus the force of friction is gonna be equal to zero newtons, all right? In that case, the applied force that he's pushing on there is equal to the force of friction. And we learned that we can calculate the force of friction using this formula. The friction coefficient, mu, times the normal force, which is equal and opposite to the force of gravity on that object, is gonna be my frictional force, which is my applied force. So the applied force is equal to 0 0.3 times 10 kilograms times 9.81 meters per second squared. That gives me my normal force. And it'll be a little less than 30 newtons, but I'm just rounding up. I'm assuming that's 10, just because I don't want to use my calculator. So 30 newtons, roughly, is going to be the applied force. So in order to calculate the work that I have to do over 10 meters, I take that applied force of 30 newtons, and I multiply it by 10. Okay, so 30 newtons, my applied force, multiplied by the distance that I push that object, will give me 300 joules. So it would take... 300 joules to slide that 10 kilogram object 10 meters, okay? Next problem, what about working against gravity? Well, the minimum work that I would do is if I lifted that object, 10 kilogram object, up that ladder at a constant velocity, that'd be the minimum. If I ran up that, I'd have to do more work than if I lifted it slowly at a constant velocity. I want you to think about that, all right? So let's calculate the amount of work required to lift that object to a total height of 10 meters above the ground. Well, first of all, I have to figure out what my applied force is gonna be. So if I'm not accelerating, my applied force is just gonna be the force of gravity on that object. And then I can apply this equation, work is equal to force times distance to calculate the work to lift that object 10 meters up above the ground. All right, so the force of gravity is going to be about 98.1 98.1 98 newtons times 10 meters, when I climb that object, that ladder 10 meters, will give me 981 joules. So lifting is pretty simple at constant velocity. It's just the force of gravity times distance, okay? So another formula I can create is mgh, okay? So the work done against gravity is going to be the mass of the object times the acceleration of gravity times the height that I lift it. We're gonna come back to that equation a little bit later on because that's an important equation that you've already seen, all right? Now, how do we look at something that's not moving up at a constant velocity, like an elevator? Imagine an elevator is going up and it's accelerating. Well, how would I calculate the work done in lifting something with acceleration? It's not as simple. So here we're gonna calculate the work performed by an elevator lifting 100 kilogram mass. Let's imagine the whole elevator is 100 kilograms with an acceleration of two meters per second squared for a distance of 10 meters. Okay, so here's the motor. It's applying, it's doing work to lift this 100 kilogram elevator up 10 meters with an acceleration of two meters per second squared. In order for this to happen, my applied force has to be greater than the force of gravity. That way I'll get acceleration. If it's the same, I have no acceleration. So I need to have an understanding of that. All right, and in order for me to calculate the work, my work is gonna be the amount of applied force that I'm applying times that 10 meter distance. So how do I calculate the applied force? Okay, well, in order to do that, I need to write down Newton's second law. My unbalanced force is gonna be the mass of the elevator times its acceleration. And what's causing the unbalanced force? Well, the applied force of the motor minus the force of gravity is going to give me that unbalance that causes the elevator to accelerate. All right, so then I can figure out my applied force by rearranging this equation. My applied force is going to be equal to the mass of the elevator times its acceleration 
plus the force of gravity on the elevator. Okay, and then by plugging the numbers in, I can see that the applied force is 1,200 newtons. Okay, now I just know that the elevator is going up 10 meters, so then the work is going to be the applied force times 10 meters, which gives me 12,000 joules. Okay, and in here, you'll see that mass times acceleration is force. So work is mass times acceleration times distance. Work is mad. And that answers what we had at the beginning of this video. Why is work mad?